Welcome to our session, uh, Earth Day at 50, an enduring vision that connects Wisconsin to the world. Uh, and thanks especially to the Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies for putting this amazing event together. Uh, I was at the 40th anniversary 10 years ago, and that was one of the highlights of my life. I'm delighted to be back. I'm Adam Rome. I'm a professor of environment and sustainability at the University at Buffalo. And I'm delighted to be here with Tia Nelson, uh, who is the climate change director at the Outrider Foundation. Uh, and both of us, Earth Day has been part of our lives for a long time. Uh, in my case, maybe 15 years, in Tia's case, almost her whole life. Uh, I wrote a book about the first Earth Day, the genius of Earth Day. Uh, and I've also just had a chance to revisit the subject, creating an audible original course. Uh, on Earth Day that's out this month. Uh, Tia is the daughter of Gaylord Nelson, who had the idea for Earth Day, uh, who had been uh, governor and then senator from Wisconsin, but really helped to launch the modern environmental movement. And she's followed in her dad's footsteps as an environmental advocate. She got her start studying wildlife ecology at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, then worked for a while in the state capitol on environmental issues before going to the Nature Conservancy, uh, where she ultimately launched their program in, in global climate change and won awards for her activism there. Uh, returned to Wisconsin to be the director of the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands, uh, and then went on to the Outrider Foundation, uh, which works on both climate change uh, and nuclear issues. And uh, at Outrider, with the help of a lot of other folks, she's just made a wonderful film that we'll be showing you shortly uh, about uh, Gaylord Nelson and Earth Day and activism today. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to start to you by asking, uh, why now? Why did you want to share the Earth Day story now, especially? Well, uh, thanks for the question, Adam. I've been reflecting uh, uh, in the lead up to the 50th anniversary, a of course, feel a great sense of uh, uh, duty to tell my father's story uh, and the success of the first Earth Day and remind people uh, of uh, the great accomplishments uh, uh, of that time. But I didn't want it just to be a, a historical look back. I wanted the youth of today to see the hope and promise of getting involved uh, in today's environmental challenges. And through uh, the story of the past, uh, uh, see the power of the future and getting involved in uh, addressing uh, the really significant environmental challenges we still face. Uh, the most important, of course, being the climate change crisis. Hope and promise. I, I love that phrase, Tia, because uh, that's so much of what the Earth Day story has come to mean for me. Um, you know, we all know it's a huge challenge to deal with climate change. Uh, and it's a huge challenge to build a sustainable society. Um, your, your dad in 1995 on the 25th anniversary thought it would take another 40 or 50 years for us to build a sustainable society. Uh, and uh, it's easy to, to despair. It's easy to, to get depressed that the progress isn't faster. But for me, the antidote to that always is thinking back to 1970 uh, and what your dad and, and the, the legions of young folks that he inspired, what they accomplished. It was really amazing, and it, it, it really changed the country, changed the world, ultimately. Uh, and that, that gives me hope. It was collective action. It wasn't just what we could do individually, but it was the power of collective action. Well, a lot of people don't realize that my father had experienced a number of defeats along the way in his journey to uh, come up with an idea that would galvanize the nation and precipitate a conversation that led to the adoption of, of uh, so many environmental laws that uh, uh, it was dubbed the environmental decade. And uh, there was no Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. A Republican president created the Environmental Protection Agency to protect our rights to breathe clean air and to drink clean water. And uh, it's, it's worth reflecting on the fact that uh, the uh, first Earth Day was multi-generational, it was bipartisan, and my father's call to action had a significant element of social and environmental justice. Um, 
in it. And uh, it was powerful and successful beyond his wildest dreams because individuals responded to that call to action in their communities and did things that were relevant, meaningful, and important to them. And that, that was a really empowering um, uh, moment and uh, a really brilliant decision, as you point out in your book, which I have here, I use <laughs> in reference uh, so frequently. Um, that was really the power of, of uh, the combination of my father's leadership and the power of grassroots action. And I reflect on that uh, uh, when I'm uh, feeling uh, uh, my, my greatest sense of despair to, to remember uh, that that power uh, exists in all of us uh, still today. And that's the story I want uh, the youth of today to, to hear. And, and you, you touch wonderfully on all of those themes in the film uh, that we're gonna show in a couple minutes. Uh, and it's worth taking a moment though, just to, to recollect, especially for people who are young, who are watching this, just how polluted uh, the country was before Earth Day. Uh, and people live with it. It wasn't news, but they, um, they hadn't really gotten the will yet to do anything about it. Uh, every city, the air was terrible, uh, visibly smoky, but also unhealthy to breathe. The rivers were in terrible shape. Many of them were just basically sewers of where people dumped, industry dumped its waste and, and cities dumped their sewage. Uh, lakes too, you couldn't fish or swim in many of them. Uh, and there were a whole bunch of other issues that were unaddressed. And uh, as you say, your, your dad worked at this, failed again and again to make it a national priority, but he never gave up. Uh, and then when he finally had the idea to tap the energy and idealism of youth, um, he had a success beyond his wildest dreams. And as you say, youth again are, 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 are uh, a great hope now that we might finally turn the corner uh, on climate change. But, but Earth Day is a great example of what people can do. I, I, and I reflect uh, on uh, that power of individual action uh, every day as I uh, uh, endeavor to engage and inspire and educate people on the climate change challenge before us and the opportunities to address that challenge, the need for everyone to become involved. And I think back, I reflect, you know, could Rosa Park, my father could not have known the success of Earth Day to come. Um, 20 million people gathering uh, on that first Earth Day. I reflect on Rosa Parks, whose simple act of defiance, simply stating the word no and refusing to move to the back of the bus during a time of segregation, how that changed the trajectory of the civil rights movement. And bringing it up to contemporary times and think of Greta Thunberg, uh, the Swedish climate activist, could she have known that the simple act of sitting in protest in front of the Swedish parliament would uh, precipitate, energize, and galvanize a global climate youth movement? Um, uh, she couldn't possibly have imagined that that was the outcome. And my point is that we get up with the tools we have, the values we have, some sense of purpose, and we do uh, what we can to make a difference. And unimaginable things can happen. And so I find that power and inspiration in my father's story uh, and in the story of the youth activists uh, today. And I, um, that's what keeps me going. And as you say, uh, Earth Day was, wildly successful beyond your dad's dreams. Um, you know, your dad was the legislator. He hoped that that pressure would come to bear on our political leaders uh, to enact tough, bold legislation to protect the environment. And that happened. It was, uh, uh, the media gave unprecedented attention to this. Politicians got the message and we got this environmental decade of legislation. But I found when I was writing my book, two other legacies, profound legacies that, that really surprised me, that hadn't gotten enough attention. Uh, and, and I think uh, one was that Earth Day helped create an eco-infrastructure. Uh, 
uh, that, that a lot of the people who were involved were inspired to create new environmental organizations, uh, to uh, go to work for new environmental agencies. Uh, and um, out of Earth Day comes uh, 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 lobbying groups, uh, new environmental beats at newspapers, publishers get the message and they publish hundreds of eco books, um, ecology centers, community centers around the country that often launch the first recycling programs, uh, environmental studies programs. All of that really comes out of Earth Day uh, and ensures that the enthusiasm of that day lasted for decades. And the other thing is Earth Day, and I think this will be a great segue to the film, uh, Earth Day inspired a whole generation of activists, mostly young people, uh, to change their plans and to devote themselves to the environmental cause. And that wasn't easy to do. There weren't a whole lot of set careers you could have, but this generation, the first green generation, they pioneered all kinds of jobs. Uh, and like you, they've, they've spent their whole careers now uh, working as, as advocates or as environmental lawyers or green architects or environmental writers or green businesses they started. Uh, all of that really wasn't anything your dad was expecting, but it made Earth Day powerful, not just for the moment, but for decades afterward. Uh, and and it's, it's really the world that all of today's activists have inherited, that they've, they've, they've been thinking about sustainability their whole lives, partly because of this Earth Day generation. Uh, so let's watch this film. It's really a wonderful short film. Uh, and I, I hope uh, all of you watching and listening will enjoy it as, as much as I did. Um, so here it is. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty while forgetting about the worst environments in America. Our goal is an environment of decency, quality, and mutual respect for all human beings and all other living creatures. Our goal is a decent environment in its broadest and deepest sense, and it will require a long, sustained political moral, ethical, and financial commitment far beyond any commitment ever made by any society in the history of man. My name is Tia Nelson. I am the daughter of Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day. My father was an extraordinary dad. He was an extraordinary leader. Growing up as his daughter, it was mostly a great privilege, but also I felt a heavy sense of duty to public service uh, and to making a difference with my life. I work for the Outrider Foundation. Our goal is to educate people about big global challenges like climate change. One of my favorite quotes from my father was delivered on the eve of the first Earth Day in 1970. He said, ecology is a, a big, big science. science. Not, not a narrow one. one. It's a big concept. And it is concerned with all the ramifications of all the relationships of all living creatures to each other and their environment. So when he talked about the environment, he talked about ecology and environment in the broadest sense, in the most inclusive sense. That idea resonated with students across the country. Collectively, they made a difference that was unforeseeable. This movement and this fight is about all of us because what is more fundamental than the air that we breathe, than water? than the soil that we stand on, than the land that we love. Like, what is more fundamental to every single one of us than that? My name is Varshini Prakash. I am from Boston, Massachusetts, and I am one of the co-founders of Sunrise Movement. We are building a movement of young people all across this nation to stop the climate crisis and create millions of good jobs for our generation in the process. 
And when I began looking back into what the first Earth Day was like, what it meant, the level of people who got involved, the kind of political action, I think for me, Earth Day now is about getting back to our roots. My father was brilliant at working across the aisle to build a consensus. Um, he knew when to compromise, he knew when to stick to his principles. Think of all of the important environmental laws that were passed after that first Earth Day, and they were passed um, uh, with significant support from both parties. For six years, um, I said that climate change was nonsense, in as much as I represented Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, probably one of the reddest districts, in the reddest state of the nation. Um, that was the end of the inquiry for me. So I, I admit that's fairly ignorant, but that's the way it was for six years. So I'm uh, Bob Inglis, and I run an outfit called RepublicEN.org, where conservatives, convincing conservatives that they're really good on climate and that they've got the answer. It's free enterprise innovation. My son, the eldest of our five kids, came to me. He uh, was voting for the first time because he just turned 18. And he said to me, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're gonna clean up your act on the environment. It's the first of a three-step metamorphosis for me. And step two was going to Antarctica with the science committee, seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. Uh, step three was another science committee trip. It's there that uh, at a stopover at the Great Barrier Reef, great uh, blessing there was meeting an Australian climate scientist named Scott Heron and just being inspired by his faith to act on climate change. When Bob spoke about climate change while serving in the United States Congress, he was primaried and he lost his election. He was attacked for speaking the words climate change. This was a transformative moment in his life and led to him dedicating his whole career today to addressing the climate change challenge. For young people growing up in this country, we have been defined by the climate crisis. People who have been born after the year 2000 have never lived a year on this planet that wasn't one of the hottest years on record. We are the climate generation. And so now, at a young age, we have realized that if our politicians aren't gonna do something about this problem, then we have to take matters into our own hands. Through leadership of people like Varshini, the youth movement has been energized in the last year in ways that uh, resemble what was happening almost 50 years ago when the first Earth Day occurred. There comes a place where activism drives even the crustiest old timer to decide to get involved. I don't think there's any other issue viewed in its broadest sense, which is as critical to mankind as the issue of the quality of the environment in which we live. Environmentalism is not a partisan issue. Environmentalism is a quality of life issue for all of us. You know, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think we're gonna solve climate change. It's gonna be that conservatives come together with progressives to figure out we're literally in this together. This is about not just changing light bulbs, this is about changing our politics. And if anything, we will be successful because we do it together. I want the youth of today to know that I have done everything that I can to ensure on the 100th anniversary of Earth Day, we are celebrating a brighter future. We're at a critical moment in history. We have an opportunity to address the greatest environmental challenge of our time. Are we able? Yes. Are we willing? That's the unanswered question. I've seen that film now, Tia, three or four times. Uh, so I've gotten past the point where the tears come. Uh, your dad was really a hero to me. And, uh, and I also really admire everything that you and Bob English and Varsini Prakash are doing. So it's just such a wonderful film. Thank you. Uh, tell me a little more about how you, you got everyone together uh, for that wonderful, wonderful film. Well, I had, um, 
come to know about Varshini uh, Pakasha's work as co-founder of the Sunrise Movement. Um, I love the name of the organization, their, their work uh, and advocacy for acting uh, with urgency on the climate crisis and had um, uh, become familiar with Bob Inglis's work and his story, which really fascinates me. Uh, he's a conservative Republican, uh, evangelical Christian, uh, a former climate skeptic, um, and he has come to uh, dedicate his life to the climate crisis through his organization, Republic Ian. And I thought Varshini's voice and Bob's voice combined together, though they have different policy responses to how to address climate change, they both see the issue as urgent. They both dedicated their lives now through the founding of these organizations to making a difference and into empowering young people to build a brighter future. And it just seemed like the perfect story to tell if I could recruit them to bring and loan their voice uh, to this story. And I was just so delighted, so extraordinarily grateful to both of them. And I just have become huge admirers of their work. And one of the points I hope the audience uh, gets from this is, it doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. There's an organization uh, and an opportunity for you to get involved uh, that, that fits your perspective and, and your political leanings. Uh, and this really uh, requires us to unite in action. You know, and for me, it, it, putting the two of them together in the film really embodies a key part of the spirit of Earth Day that, it, as you say, it was bipartisan, which is almost inconceivable nowadays. Um, but, but back in 1970, the problems were obvious. It wasn't always clear what to do about them, and Republicans and Democrats had different ideas about that. But uh, other than a, a, a far-right fringe that thought Earth Day was a communist plot, that it was subversive, um, most conservatives, most Republicans recognized something had to be done. Uh, and uh, there really wasn't denialism in the way that there is now. So uh, that's, that's really crucial because if people accept that there's a problem, uh, then you can have a conversation. That's the foundation yep. for getting people like, like Bob, like Varshini in the same room talking about what needs to be done. And, and that's always gonna be productive. Um, so that's where we need to get again, and, and hopefully uh, your film will, will highlight that, that it is possible, uh, even now, even in our polarized times, it is possible to get people to agree, we've got a challenge, we've got to figure out how to do something about it, and everyone can be part of, of doing something about it. My, my father, as you know, uh, had a lot of talents, but, but one of his most remarkable talents was his ability to get people with uh, different ideologies to uh, get together in a room and, and, and work on the big challenges of the day. And so I thought Bob and Barshini's voice uh, uh, would help remind people. 1970 was a very politically divided time, and there was a, a great... Um, concern in the country and uh, division in the country and and yet uh, due to a variety of factors my father's leadership uh, along with the grassroots response to his call to action uh, somehow the political will uh, was created um, uh, for uh, remarkable progress and I believe that we can uh, do that again and I believe that Bob and Barshini's story helps remind us of that power. I think of also the Citizen Climate Lobby, which is operating in every congressional district in the country, Democrats and Republicans alike, working together uh, to uh, put forward in Congress climate solutions. And so I, I hope people will take a minute to go to outrider.org um, uh, Earth Day. Uh, we have some resources there that will help people um, uh, find a way to get involved, uh, aligned with uh, their their own personal perspectives. There's something each and every one of us can do, and uh, the important thing is that we we do what we can, and that we all become involved. You know, and I think that was part of your dad's genius too. Um, he really hoped that Earth Day 
would lead to legislative action. You know, that, that's what was most important to him. Uh, and, it, and it did, and it inspired a lot of young people to go into the legislative arena. But it also inspired a lot of young people to go off in many other directions that, that your dad couldn't have foreseen. Uh, but but that, that was what was so wonderful about his leadership was that he empowered all these other folks. Uh, and most of them were like Varshini. They, they were in their, they were 20 somethings or even teenagers. Uh, and they had to be really entrepreneurial in creating the organizations and the opportunities and the career paths that would make a difference. And the experience of working on Earth Day, especially organizing all the local events, there were, oh, let's say, 13,000 Earth Day events across the country. They all had to be organized by people who spent often months at it. And that was a transformative experience uh, in the same way that, that Varshini comes to it from having worked on fossil fuel divestment. Um, one last point, I think, too, that I, I hadn't really appreciated until I saw your film about Bob Inglis, even though I, I'd heard about him. And um, uh, like your dad, two things, you know, he, he's got to have a high tolerance for failure. The Republican Party right now is not really a welcoming place for him to be, to be preaching, but he's, he's not giving up and that's incredibly admirable. But he's also putting a lot of his faith in young people. Uh, most of his speaking is on college campuses and, and he's finding that a lot of young people, uh, their generational identity as people who've grown up in a world of changing climate is trumping their, their tribal Republican identity. Uh, and, and, um, and I think that was part of the success of Earth Day uh, that, that your film embodies, is uh, bringing older people who can mentor young people, who can encourage them, who can inspire them. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, Earth Day was a youth quake. It was, uh, and, and that's what we need today, a youth quake on, on climate change. Well, it's interesting. Um, if you look at the polling data, uh, regardless of political ideology, youth today prioritize the climate change issue. There's um, a really remarkable uh, uh, power in that. And that is something that uh, inspires me um, because uh, uh, left, right, or center youth of today uh, are, are living um, uh, in the climate crisis and they feel a sense of urgency to act. And they may have different ideas on what the appropriate policy response is, uh, but that's okay. Let's, let's, uh, let's have a discussion and, and uh, debate the solutions, not the science, and uh, find united, find a path forward. And really what I hope people take from this film is uh, that there is power in individual action uh, and that we all can make a difference and that there's something each and every one of us can do to build a brighter future. That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful last word, Tia, but if you have anything else you want to say, uh, go ahead. But it's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful talking with you, getting together with you again, even if virtually. Uh, thanks for making the film. Any, any other thoughts? Or just that I'm sorry I'm not seeing you in person at, at our, our great event in, in beautiful Madison. Um, but it's been delightful to have this discussion with you here. I'm so grateful to you and, and uh, it, it, I learned so much. For, you know, I, I have lived with this story a long time. I've, but I, I learned so much from your book, The Genius Birthday. And, and uh, uh, I'm just delighted to have had this chance to have this conversation, put it in, spec in perspective. Um, the, the past, the present, and of course, uh, the future. And so I, I, I thank you, Adam, very much. Terrific.